morning. First of all, we're all just very excited to have your students here. We are. We hire people here who are very student-centered, and that's really the, uh, the core of what we do. Uh, and we wanted to give you, as parents, an overview of what goes on here. What are the things we have to offer to your students? Uh, how do we prepare students for the world of work? What's going on in the world of work? Uh, and then what are some things you should think about as you think about your four years? I got two kids in college. Laura has a kid in college here, and you've put five kids through college. Mm -hmm. So we certainly know where you are, uh, where you're at, so I, I, I really, um, I really, we, we really care about that, and we're really happy you're here. So when you think about what is, the core, what is our core business, why are we here, there's two elements that I, that I want to focus on. One is, obviously, we want to prepare your students, our students, to, be, make, to make a positive difference in their organizations, in their communities, and in the world. But we also want to inspire them. And by that, we mean we want to expose them to all possibilities of ways in which they can make that contribution. We want to expose them to different <laughs> career paths, to different ways of taking what they're interested in and applying it in some way or another. So we bring speakers. We bring all kinds of different people who they can get uh, exposure to. Uh, you know, again, as I mentioned, uh, as I look at my kids, they don't really know what all the options are because they've only seen a little slice of life, right? And so we want to make sure that we inspire them say, oh, that sounds really interesting. I could do that. So we, we take that very seriously. I take that very seriously. And the positive impact piece is really important to us as well. Um, our employers, our alums, always talk about how our students go in and day one, they just make a positive difference right away. So when I think about what decisions we make and how we make decisions in the school, there are four things that I always focus on when we say, okay, should we do this or not? And what should we be doing? One, does it make us better? So excellence is a core value for us. How do we, what standards do we hold ourselves to and what standards do we hold our students to? And so if it makes us better, we're always striving to be better. We never want to rest on our laurels, number one. Number two is relevance. Is what we're teaching and what we're doing important to, the, to, the, to what issues are of the day? What's going on in the business world? What's going on in the world at large? So relevance is important and that happens in many different ways. At the class level, our faculty members are experts in their field. They're very much engaged in what's going on in the world. So they're always bringing in examples, speakers, problems that are relevant, that are uh, germane to the issue. We want to make an impact, obviously, first and foremost, on our students' lives. We want to make sure that our students are able to go out uh, and have successful careers. But we want to make an impact in our community. We want to make an impact in the world. I feel like, um, as at the University of Richmond and the Robin School, that uh, if you take it at the, at the city of Richmond level, I want people in the city of Richmond to feel like the city is better off because the Robin School exists, right? I want to make sure that, and we're doing a lot of things to connect our students with the city to get applied experiences. And finally, we want to build a sense of community. We want to build a sense that uh, people belong, that people are supported, people are challenged. Uh, by one another and uh, and one of the things I feel very fortunate about is even just our physical layout in the building uh, I, I, I'd like to joke my, to my fellow um, Deans across the campus. We have five schools uh, that I can sort of put my arms around the school right my all my Students and faculty are all in this building if you think about arts and sciences. They're scattered all over uh, If you think of well, Jepson, I guess is in one place, but they don't have their, They're part of a building so we're very fortunate in that we're able to see each other every day We're able to interact with each other every day and create that sense of community. One of the things, I, I know some of you, actually, let me I get a show of hands here. How many of you parents have a first year student? Mm. Okay. How many have a second year student? Third year? Seniors? <laughs> okay, that's what, we, that's what we suspected. Um, so you're probably very interested in how do you get into the school and what goes on in the school and what happens after school. So that's great. And that's, that's kind of what our focus in, um, is in. So in the second semester, sophomore year, we have a declaration ceremony for our students. And we'll talk later about how you get into the school. But what we want to make sure is that students understand what it means to be part of the Robin School community. And you probably saw these uh, when you came in in either direction into the building. But we make sure that our students understand what it means to get a business degree here. And we ask them to, um, to commit to this, um, to this credo here, to act with integrity, hold themselves up to the highest ethical standards, because that's really what it comes down to striving for excellence, being constructive, and using their skills for positive impact. And we have an, a, a ceremony where our students uh, declare uh, their intention to be in the, in the Robin School, and, um, and it's really exciting. So it, make, it marks a punctuation between their time coming in as undeclared students their first couple of years, and now they're part of our community, although they've been taking classes 
here all along. So, and, and, and by the way, we are one university, so it's not like we wall ourselves off from the rest. In fact, we require our students to take 17 units at least outside of the business school because we feel that's really important. All right, so you know, we were having some conversations with some folks. So this is my fourth year here, and people ask what drew me here. Um, there are many elements of what makes, I think, the Robin School special and the University of Richmond special, and these are uh, probably what I would say are the critical ones. One is the Liberal Arts Foundation. If you look at, I know we're all very proud of the recent ranking, 18th. Um, you know, we are a full-size business school, just as large and just as mighty, and our faculty can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against any faculty in most research one universities, large universities. So that's hard to, I think it's, uh, people need to understand that, right? Most of these liberal arts schools ahead of us in the rankings or behind us in the rankings don't have a full business school like we have. But I think we're a better business school because we have the Liberal Arts Foundation, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. The other is we have a BSBA degree that creates, exposes students to a broad foundation of elements across the spectrum of, of business world. So they take classes and the core classes in, in organizational behavior, finance, marketing, operations, e uh, accounting, economics, right? So they understand various aspects and how they all interrelate. And I think that's a strength. We were just in New York with a group of students who run our, managed, our student managed investment fund. And we heard from several of our alums and parents and, employ and employers who were hosting us how important that is. Um, you know, take your example, you work in a private equity firm, you're trying to understand a business, you might be an investment, and you have to understand the various pieces of it. Uh, so I think that's important. The other is we feel like not only are our faculty top rate and some of the best faculty in the world, in our opinion, uh, and I think our students would agree with that. But also we believe con in connecting what's going on in the classroom with what's, connecting what's going on in the world. So we give them a lot of experiential learning opportunities and we'll talk about that. That's a course uh, strategy of ours. And finally, everybody here is just focused on the success of our students. Student-centered is really what it's about and that's what drew me here. I started my career uh, out of grad school many years ago. I've been a professor for 30 years. Uh, I, my first 10 years at Rice, which was a very it was a very small university at the time, 2,700 undergraduates. We lived on campus, my wife and I, uh, to run one of the residential colleges. Our kids were born there. So I wanted to go back to a place that was really devoted to the lives of our students and making a difference in our students' lives. And that's who we hire as well. And I think all of that adds up to making a transformative experience for our students. All right, so the Liberal Arts Foundation, um, it's, it's really important if you think about the context under which business, business doesn't operate in a vacuum, right? And I'll have some, I'll show you some um, headlines of what's going on in the world to really punctuate the fact that businesses have had to deal with a lot of stuff going on in the world and navigate. Um, so that gives them a foundation for understanding this context. Uh, another thing we always hear from, from uh, employers is they really have to be well-rounded. They really have to understand the connections. I mentioned our student managed investment fund. When they do pitches, I love listening to the pitches they make about why their theses for why they went in a particular way or another, either with a growth fund or the value fund, they're based on things like demographic trends, societal trends, right? They're all based on broad level macro issues and how they might impact uh, consumer behavior or some other uh, issue like that. All that comes from that liberalized foundation. There's a lot of cross school programs. We have several, um, uh, collaborations with the other schools across campus. They come out well-rounded. And honestly, because we're a liberal arts institution, a lot of, that, of what that means from the Carnegie Foundation perspective is our classes are a certain size and we graduate students from a certain, and I think that creates a level of engagement and a level of uh, preparation you can't hide in a small class. Right? If you want to teach critical thinking, if you want to teach kids to make a point and be able to, uh, to defend that point, you got to do that in a small class. You can't be in a group of 200 students and have that exchange. So <coughs> I think that's critical. So here's a lot of things um, that are going on, not, some not so pretty, but you know, for what are business uh, leaders having to beat nowadays? As it relates to the issue of hybrid work and going back to work, they're having to be psychologists, they're having to be sociologists, they're having to be politicians and understand the winds of politics and whether or not they're going to be on the wrong side if you're BlackRock and you're trying to do business in Texas. You know, what does that mean? Um, it's just very challenging. It's very complicated. Business leaders for the last few years have had to be public health experts uh, or have to become public health experts all of a sudden. You really have to know the context, and we feel that that's one of the advantages of being in a school like the University of Richmond. So I'll turn it over to Joyce uh, and talk a little bit about our faculty and some of the exper experiential opportunities that we have. 
So as Mickey mentioned, we have world-class faculty. And the liberal arts provides a wonderful foundation. And in the business school, we're going to provide them the professional skills and analytical skills that they need to succeed in business. We have dedicated teachers, Professor Joe Hoyle. He's well known. And in fact, I think what, there's an alumni here who knows Joe Hoyle. Um, and his son is in Joe Hoyle's class this oh, semester. Fun. Yeah, so I thought that was fun. But Joe, and I wrote this down so I get it straight, straight. He was the first recipient of the American Accounting Association's Best Undergraduate Teacher. That's a nationwide award. And that was Professor Hoyle. He also has written the textbook for advanced financial accounting that's used pretty much as a standard across the US. Another accounting professor, OK, and I have to admit, I'm an accounting professor too, but I didn't just pick that department. It just, <laughs> this, this was recent, um, is Nancy Bogranoff. And she received, last year, received the Distinguished Achievement in Accounting Education Award from the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. So you can see they're well recognized as teachers and also as scholars. Professor Violet Ho does, is the chair of our marketing department and her research is an employee, yeah. excuse me? Management department. Management, oh, yeah. I said marketing. Management department, thank you. And her research is in employee behavior, which would make more sense in the management department. Yes. Um, <laughs> And Professor Jeff Harrison, also in the management department, mm -hmm. he is a world-recognized scholar in stakeholder management theory. So the wonderful thing is, is that your students have the opportunity to be in classes with our professors. None of our classes are taught by teaching assistants. Our average class size in the School of Business is 20, and that's even amongst our core classes. You'll have some that are a little bigger, you'll have some that are smaller, but those are, it is at 20, and that is, incredible given the size of business school classes elsewhere. So as Mickey said, you can't really hide in a class of 20. So that's good and sometimes the students think that's not so good. <laughs> but we do feel it's really important for our students to get out and outside of the classroom to incorporate what they're learning. That really seems to help them to see what it means in real world practice and that makes a huge impact. So we've got a lot of things listed up here, everything from the Spider Business Hub to mentoring programs. We're just gonna highlight a few of those today, but these are, you can find information on these on our website and please come up afterward if you have any questions. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, and I know that's especially among um, first year students, it's I wanna study abroad, how can I do that? I'm just gonna talk a little bit about that. International business, these days, small businesses, large businesses, almost all of them are involved in international activities at some, in some way, either their suppliers or their distribution network. So it permeates business. And it's the same thing here in the school. International business just permeates everything we do in all of our classes. We do have some IB concentration, international business concentration exchange students, but really what I'm gonna talk about now is the study abroad component. So we strongly encourage our students to study abroad. We think it really opens a perspective, opens the worldview for them. And we feel like that's really important. As I said, most businesses are working in the international environment at some level. So it's important to have that, just that understanding. About 50% of our students do study abroad. The, most, the majority of them is in the fall of their junior year. And where do they go? We have partner schools located across the world. And these schools are not ones that we just go to some outside source or shop. not that they're bad, but go to an outside person and say, you know, find a spot for them. These are where we have actual partnership agreements that we've written with these schools. And these are world-renowned business schools. So everything from the London School of Economics to the Copenhagen Business School to the Singapore Management Institute to um, South America. We've got several in Brazil and the Catolica in the Brazil. In, in those areas. So your student will have an opportunity to determine, you know, where is it that they want to go. Now, one caveat on that, there are requirements for the school. So they can't just say Barcelona is very popular. You've probably heard that. They can't just say, I want to go to Barcelona. Okay, what is your concentration? What is your, or your major? Um, how does this school fit with that? The schools themselves have requirements. GPA does matter. So the schools will be looking at the student's GPA. There also is an application process. And they can, and if you wanna to go to Italy, for instance, and we've got some excellent schools in Italy, um, they prefer students who have had an Italian language course. 
So if your student wants to go there and has a good GPA in an Italian language course, they're going to go up and they're going to be like, OK, because it's not just us saying you're going to go there. It's the other schools on the other side. But the good news is our students end up going to or having opportunities to study abroad. And even the ones that don't get into their first choice come back and say it was an incredible experience. So maybe they ended up in Copenhagen instead of Barcelona. They still have an incredible experience. Anything else we need to cover there? No, I was going to say my son spent two weeks in Copenhagen this summer and loved it. So. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a good point. Because we do have um, short-term study abroad programs as well. So um, I take in sustainability, I or have a class that I do in the spring. And last year, we went to London to the International Sustainability Standards Board. And we met there with people from Citibank from the ISSB, and that was a part of a course. So they have opportunities to do that. Next spring, we're probably going to go to Cape Town, South Africa yeah. to study sustainability there. So that's also an opportunity available to them. Mickey also mentioned how we liked, we think it's important for our students to have a community connection and to be able to give back to the community. The Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program is one of those programs that we run. It is an IRS program, and it is, most universities run it. Um, we do run it such that we have a downtown Richmond site. So we run it in person, so the students are trained by IRS, by us, to prepare the taxes, and then they met, this is last year, we met in person, and they were able to file these returns for the people. Now, you might think, when we talk to the students and we meet, when I meet with them throughout their work on the VITA, um, it's, it'll be like, well, what are you learning? The main thing that they get is client interactions, working with people. For many of them, think about it. This could be, and this is open to first years through seniors. It could be a student First year, it's, we run this obviously in the spring when the IRS, when the tax returns are due. They could be working with an older couple, helping them, a lot of our clients are retired couples, helping them to complete their tax returns. The sense of um, responsibility that they learn, that yeah, these people are relying on me. Understanding another person's position, it is just really amazing. So can't say enough about this program, I love it. And also, we have started just in the last couple of years where well, students can do this as a tax preparer. They can also come back as quality reviewers. So they are helping the students who are preparing, and then they review it before it's actually filed with the IRS. And this gives them really good management skills. So as I said, this is a program that I really like because it's the community, the appreciation is amazing because not only do they get the refunds, but think about it, they're not having to pay someone to do their tax return. It's a huge thing for them. Summer research. So we have this great faculty. So, and this is also available to first year students. So the summer of their, as they're a rising sophomore, if they are curious about something, there's a question that came up in their econ class or that came up in one of their other courses, and they're thinking, I'd really like to explore this. So this is the student's idea and the student's question. They can get together with, our, um, with a faculty member and say, I want to be able to work on this over the summer. They can use a Richmond guarantee, so that's $5,000. So if they're going to put in that time, they can use that to help fund this. And the type of research, this is, research that was done. We had 10 students participating in this last summer, working with different faculty members, and this is some of the papers that they wrote. But what it does is, you have a question, so what do you do about that? Where do you get the data? How do you analyze it? What databases are available? How do I formulate a research question? And then at the end of the summer, they put it together in a paper and do a presentation. Um, Mickey came to the presentation this past summer, and the students did an incredible job. Yeah. One of the students, from their summer research work is going on to work with the professor to um, publish the paper. So that's exciting. And I think, okay. I think I'm going back to you now. Yes. <laughs> Another way, really exciting new program, um, if any of you were at the Parents Leadership Council yesterday, I talked about this, um, is the um, Spend Shop. Come on in, please. There's lots of space. Y'all yeah. are acting like you're your own st students. You sit towards the back. Yeah. <laughs> space up here. Adults are no different, right? I might have to make a quick exit or something. Um, 
Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Um, so our benchtop innovation class, again, talk about what is extreme business experience. What about starting a business and running a business? So we wanted to create an opportunity for students to go from idea to revenue in a year, two semesters. So last year is a pilot program where we had um, 16 students work with two professors. One is a professor in our marketing department, uh, um, Joel Meyer, who actually was one of the early employees at Netflix. Uh, and uh, Shane Emmett, who's one of our entrepreneurs in residence, who started a company called Health Warrior and ended up selling that to, um, to PepsiCo and is still doing more entrepreneurial work. He has several companies he's working on. So the two of them work with 16 students, broken up into teams of four, and each of the four teams experimented with some sort of food product. Uh, and we have a kitchen, a commercial kitchen in the Quealy Center where you probably went when you were looking at the, uh, at the university. Uh, there's a beautiful commercial kitchen there, so they experimented. They would have classes there, different formulations of different products. We had a bake-off in November. The winning product and all students in the class collapse around that product and learn how to commercialize it. How do we find a production partner? How do we then sell this? And so they set up Shopify pages. They go beat the bushes around different uh, outlets for how to sell this. And what they came up with last year was a bean-based trail mix called Absurd Snacks. And you might have seen it or heard about it. I certainly encourage you to look it up. And now there's two seniors who are in that class, two of the founders, who are now taking that, and that's their full-time job. They're now taking that in commercial. They have about 17 different partners around the city that sell the product. They uh, just changed production facilities from here in Richmond to Denver because the Denver facility is actually a certified nut-free so they can make that one of there. It's vegan uh, also. Uh, it's just phenomenal. It's done really, really well. They've done some pitches up in New York and some, tra some trade shows. Um, they've done, they're doing a capital race right now. Uh, and they, I just had pointed them our startup in residence so that they can then t work with our students to get that experience. Uh, so it's really, really exciting. And so we're going to take that class. We're doing it again this year. Uh, and this year they have to, and by the way, that was supported by a very generous gift from the Brown Family Foundation that supported a lot of our CIE, Creativity, Innovation, Entrepreneurship uh, initiatives across campus. Uh, this year they're doing a beverage product. My understanding, it can't be alcoholic. Um, so I guess seltzer um, apparently is very popular. They can't do kombucha either because they don't want to do any kind of brewing or anything like that. Um, so they're now at the stage of experimenting with different things. I heard something about sweet potato, this, that, and the other. I don't know. Things I've heard, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't like to drink my vegetables, I guess is the way I think so. But I'm, I may not be the target audience for them, the target market. Um, the other thing we're really excited about is um, how do we get our students to take what they're learning in a classroom and, and try it out and help somebody else with that. So the Spider Business Hub is our um, connection of our students to the city. And the way the Spider Business Hub works is we have a faculty member who is a director of the hub who curates projects in small businesses across the city. These are businesses who um, can't afford really to get any help. So they may be a business who's starting to get on social media and they don't know how to do that. Or they really need to help, a little bit of help with their uh, strategic planning process or a little bit of help with their operations and thinking how that works. Uh, and so those curated projects are we have a repository of them. Individual students, any students, can go to the Spider Business Hub and say, oh, that sounds like an interesting project. I'd like to work on that. Or a professor who's running a class says, I want to put an applied project as a requirement in my class. They go to the hub and find a project that's appropriate. So last year, we had over 100 students participate in client-based projects through the, um, through the Spider Business Hub. So we think this is really a great win-win-win for many different levels. So these organizations are getting the help that they need that they can't afford to do uh, to get, our students are really getting, and again, just as Joy said, yes, the, the, the kind of problems they're working on are interesting and they're getting to apply some of what they're learning, but it's really that client relationship. How do I, how do I work with somebody else's schedule? How do I scope a project to make sure that we're doing what needs to be done? How do I deal with their, you know, all the issues that come up in that client relationship? How do I build trust? How do I build that communication? Uh, it's really invaluable. It's really, really exciting. So this is one of the really big initiatives that we have going on right now. I mentioned our Student Management Investment Fund. This is all seniors who uh, run a uh, piece of our endowment. Uh, it started out, I forget how much it was when it was first sounded, in a couple hundred thousand. It's now over 
depending on what the market's doing, right? It's about a, about a million dollars, let's say. Well, I, I didn't put the current value, actually. Uh, I think it's, uh, it varies by day. Just under 900,000 tonight. Okay. <laughs> so. so then we split it up into value, and, and there's a value set of managers and a growth set of managers. And, they, uh, and there's a general manager. And they make all the trades. They make all the decisions. Uh, we go to, this is the picture we took two weeks ago when we were up in New York uh, visiting with a lot of different investment houses, all the way from Goldman Sachs, Blackstone. Um, um, we went to, no, we didn't go to Barclays. We went to uh, Morgan Stanley and then some other ones, Tetragon, Millennium, Fund, Millennium Management, uh, and then some other private boutique, private equity firms. It's a great experience. So I view the, the Spider Business Hub that I talked about before as a way, because this is like experiential learning on steroids, right? I mean, what better way to learn how to do something than by actually building it? So I view the Spider Business Hub as a way of providing a Smith-like experience for all our students, no matter what their major is and what they're interested in. So we're really excited about that. Um, you want to talk about some internships, too? Sure, I can. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The reason we're, we talk about this is because they're um, uh, working with our retirement money, um, so it's important that we know um, uh, Good point. what the numbers are. Um, <laughs> anyway, because that's not been a fun subject lately, right? Um, hey there. Uh, I know that um, especially um, some of my uh, families that I've already met, I know that um, we've got some Arizona we hear, we've got California, we've got Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey. And so you're probably wondering, are they coming home this summer to me, or are they going someplace else to do an internship? Um, well, I can't guarantee they're coming home to you, um, but I can pretty much guarantee that they'll have internship opportunities related to us in, in the business school and at the university. Um, we have lots of career services resources. Uh, this is a picture of Becca. Becca graduated last year, and she was a double concentrator in marketing and international business. She studied abroad in Paris, but then her internship was actually in Munich, Germany, where the Virginia Economic Development Commission has a European office. And so, you know, that was kind of, uh, you know, take all those pieces together and plunk her someplace else. So you really never know kind of what opportunities are gonna be out there. And a lot of our internship opportunities come from employers who come to campus each week. They table maybe here in the tower. Um, you all have probably seen them, right? Um, and uh, so you can talk to them. And then also through some of the connections that we have with our alums and our families who, you know, I just talked with a dad yesterday who was like, how can I suggest that my firm could get some interns? And you know, so there's lots of options. Come on, we'll talk to some. I, you know, I think that um, as we talked about kind of with um, some of the opportunities that, you know, where you're developing your skills and you know, you might be thrown into a situation where high school didn't quite prepare you for that. Uh, you know, for my first year student, uh, as a sophomore, this is midpoint of sophomore year, so the last weekend in January, we have this event that we call Q-Camp. And it's uh, sort of a boot camp kind of for the adults in the room, like a conference style situation where we take you to the one of the hotels. Anybody staying at the Westin? No, it'll be at the Westin. Um, we take you out to the Westin, the sophomores, and um, run series of kind of workshops on anything from kind of business dinners, you know, how do you manage that? to um, networking opportunities, some cocktail things with that, different breakout sessions to talk about everything from maybe your personality style, your communication styles, to uh, you know just how in different interviews you would handle it. So it works really much on the soft skills. Our students for that pretty much suited up, and so they are acting like professionals for uh, that 24-hour period. That we leave on a um, Friday, come back on a Saturday evening. And uh, anyway, that's, that's what that is. And yeah, this w the students in the picture right here, um, those are our student ambassadors. So we have it for sophomores, but then our ones who really like that experience can apply to be ambassadors for the next years as juniors and as seniors. And uh, you know, again, thinking about as first years, since I know most of our audience is first year families, first year students, we do have some juniors um, that, I, you know, you might be thinking about, well, how can my child get involved? As you, the child, how can I get involved? And this behind us is a list of different organizations and clubs that we have often that map to different majors. You know, so accounting society for our students who are thinking about being accountants. 
Finance Society for our students who are being uh, thinking about finance. Monday night at 7.30, we have our sports analytics group. Those would be obviously our business analytics concentrators might be interested in that. But it's open to any concentration, any majors. So uh, if you like the idea of the sports analytics group, they're meeting at 7.30 on Monday night in the cave to talk about analytics and then watch mm -hmm. the football game. I think the Cowboys are playing the Giants and gonna do some activities related to that. So that's kind of fun. Um, a fun way to kind of combine interests, business, that kind of thing. We also have two business fraternities, Alpha Kappa Psi and Delta Sigma Pi, and they've already had their rush season for this fall, but they'll have it again in the spring, so if that's something you might be interested in doing. Um, some of the other ones, women in business, women in economics, women in business obviously for all majors, women in economics, most of you all are, who are first years are taking Econ 101 this fall or maybe in the spring, so that's an opportunity too. And um, these fun pictures behind me, um, those are some of the events that we organize for students, for faculty, um, for our staff, just to get involved and kind of to promote the community of a business school. You know, students, if you found a good place to study on campus, um, there are some buildings on campus that are quieter study spaces. Ours is a bit more of a social study space in parts of it. And I think it's fun because it kind of emphasizes that a lot of business is about relationships and about networking. And so some of the events kind of are with that as a focus. This one in the top with the dog um, there, that's where we have at different, some of the more stressful times during the academic year. We have on campus uh, uh, kind of therapy dogs who are here, and so students kind of love that because they miss your puppies and you know, from <laughs> home, right? Um, and then these two events on the outside, those are events that we do as a senior year. If you have a moment in your weekend or another visit to campus, you might like to stop by the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. It's free, and um, it's a wonderful, wonderful museum, and we host our senior dinner there. So that's the big fancy event over here, and the, you'll, you would see that room if you went to the, um, and then that's the networking event beforehand, and or the social event at that point. Uh, and then we have you know different um, picnics. If you're, um, um, I'll, actually, I'll talk about that in a second. This one's Joyce mentioned that she takes uh, the trip to London. This picture at the bottom is uh, on the street in London. You're in it, Mickey, too, uh -huh. right? <laughs> um, and uh, so it just, I think, to emphasize that a lot of your class experiences can also be a community building experience. So, and uh, I'll, Mickey's gonna talk in a second about some stuff, but I'll talk yeah. about this picture so I can get you to put some dates on your calendars. Um, if you are a first year parent, this will be you all um, with your student um, in the Robin Center. That's where our basketball team plays. And we tend to have uh, graduation usually always on Mother's Day. So if you're a first year parent, mark your calendar for May 11th, 2026. Um, if you're a sophomore parent, mark your calendar for May 10th, um, 2025. And um, my junior parents, your Mother's Day next year, right? Um, so anyway, just to kind of give you an idea. But uh, I know that a lot of you all at this point are thinking like, what can they do now? Um, and then also hoping that what they do now is gonna prepare them for later. So I think if that's okay to pass it off to you, Mickey. Yes, um, thank you, Laura. You're welcome. And maybe I should step back a little bit. You know, we're just very, I feel very fortunate to work with people like Laura and Joyce. We have 125 approximate faculty and staff all in a building devoted to just one thing, which is making sure our students are leaving here prepared, inspired, and ready to make a difference. And this is what we hear. So we did a project um, couple, over the last couple of years. We went and asked alumni, uh, professors, students, uh, employers, uh, what this differentiates our students? What are the characteristics of our students? How do we prepare our students? And they said there's three things that were unique about our students. One is, and I mentioned some of these already, they have a broad perspective. They're able to put the pieces together, partly from their liberal arts foundation that they have, partly from our broad business school education from the BSBA uh, perspective. And they are able to make connections. They're able to really navigate various aspects of the a business environment. The other is they're also when they get curious about something or when they are curious about something, they also want to go deep. They're not afraid to roll up their sleeves and do the work and actually get in deep in something. So they have a depth of knowledge that is really unparalleled. I was uh, talking to some parents yesterday at an event, and my, my favorite story is I had, a, I, have a, I had a dad come up to me and says, I have two kids, one went to Wharton, one went to Richmond. I would hire the Richmond one every day over the other one. <laughs> so I kind of, I love that story. Um, <laughs> 
anyway. And I have a daughter that goes to Penn, so I like to tell her that story. Um, but the, um, so that's really important. And, and, and that is one of the things that we read, and that relates to that number three here. Our students just outperform. They just go in, they put their nose down, they do what needs to be done, and they just out-hustle. They just, you know, we, we are humble in the sense that we don't take anything for granted. You know, we're willing to do whatever work needs to be done. Uh, and our students, uh, they, they embody that and they do that. They go into, uh, it says, you know, I was just talking to a parent yesterday who interacts, he's, a, he's an attorney and works with a lot of different investment houses and he was telling me that some of the folks that he works at at Goldman Sachs, he says, boy, those Richmond kids, just, they just out hustle everybody else. And they do that, they get in. And early on, obviously we were less, a smaller school, so you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, we were lesser known. Our kids would kind of find their way into these big organizations kind of through back doors. Maybe they had a, an alum who kind of got them in to do an interview, uh, and they just, they just rise. And over time, now they're just coming into the front door. They're saying, we want these Richmond kids. So it's really exciting to see that. This day one ready is something we hear all the time. They just come in and hit the ground running, partly because of QCamp, partly because of things like the Spider Business Hub, all the experiential opportunities, not to mention some of the other things we have. We have executives and residents that come and, uh, and table out here uh, to talk to our students about their careers and give them advice on things that they should, they should think about, whether it be what kind of internships they should have, how they should think about their courses, uh, and all of that. So we just try to wrap around a lot of different experiences. And so I think I'd probably a message that I would have to you all parents is, and this is what I tell my kids, is you know, the schools that you go to have this wide array of opportunities, it's like a buffet that's been laid out. And you have to sort of think about what do I want to put on my plate, but you have to go to the buffet. And so it's up to the students to come in now. The advantage that I have, and this is what I tell my kids that it's a little bit different where they go, is here you can't help but just have it right in front of you. You don't have to elbow anybody out. It's just right there. It's easy to access. And that's why being in a small university like this with large university resources and large university opportunities is just the best combination. Uh, and I think that's what leads to this. Um, some of our employment outcomes, this is uh, six months out. Um, I just wanna highlight the yellow because what that number means is what percentage of our students are doing what they want to do. Not every kid goes out and works right away. Some go to graduate school, some wanna travel in Europe, some wanna do whatever, but 98% of the class of 2021, six months out, were doing what they wanted to do. And out of those, you can see 83% of them, one of them to be, wanted to be employed, and they are employed. 11 of them wanted to go to grad school, and they're in grad school. There's only 2% that are still seeking. So we get really good employment outcomes. And I think part of that has to do with the kind of the curation and care of atten and attention that we give our students throughout their journey here. Career services, we work very closely with them. Um, given the size of the institution, and we partner with them on things like these spiders on Wall Street, spiders in Silicon Valley, and we have these trips where students can get exposure to different uh, organizations and different industries. Coming up, there, so with the students out here and parents, there's uh, Demystifying Wall Street, um, there's, uh, they usually have demystifying healthcare. So they have, Career Services provides opportunities for them to learn about different industries. So they had one not too long ago about consulting, I believe, right? And so there's other things like that. So I would say, this is something I kept harping on my daughter when she was a freshman, go get on Handshake, go get on Handshake. Right? That's the system, and we just changed, changed to Handshake. So make sure you have a profile on Handshake and you make sure you check that for opportunities. That's where they put, communicate all these uh, events that they have. So we're very uh, proud of, uh, of the, our outcomes. Some of the salary ranges here, you know, there's a big range of salaries, partly because some of our students go and work internationally and the exchange rates are such that it's not maybe as high or maybe they'd be graduate students, but we do have a, 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 a very good uh, outcome as far as that's concerned. Big ranges, big standard deviation, and they're starting to get more bonuses. We're waiting on class of 2022 outcomes with inflation and the, um, and, um, and the need for talent, the war for talent at this point may be higher, uh, but we, it's still a little noisy. That data's still coming in, so I'll come back and we'll tell you what that is. Some of the companies that we hire, um, obviously we have a, a, some accounting students that would go to the big four, so they tend to hire a number of our students, uh, but we put students in all kinds of different companies. So our number one destination for students is uh, New York. Uh, number two is now Richmond, uh, and DC is right there, uh, and then they go all over the place. I know we have a kid who's working at Goldman Sachs in 
in, uh, in Seattle. We have one that's working in Baltimore. I mean, they're just all over, and then internationally, too. And Mickey, and I want to point yeah, yeah, out, please. too, that with the um, big firms, it looks like it's just all accounting. That's not the case. They hire for consulting. That's they true. hire for their Fair mergers enough. and acquisitions practice. They hire for their security, cybersecurity practices. Yeah. So they're hiring all of our different types of business majors. Yeah, and they love our majors. And our alumni, that's the other thing I should mention, because I don't think I have a slide about this. Our alumni network and our alumni are just so loyal. They're so devoted. There really is something special about the spider network. They just love to give back. When, it, when I first came to campus, I got to do um, alumni receptions throughout the country. We did like eight or nine of them uh, I did with the, with the president at the time. And the turnout is just incredible. And just the level of excitement about the school, the trajectory, the momentum that we have. And our, and our perspective that we are just always looking to be better and we're looking to make a difference in our students. We don't believe we're arrived. We never all ever arrive, right? We're always striving to be better and that's what we are and I think that's what shows up in our students. So we're really excited, lots of opportunities. And you as parents, if you're thinking about, well, how can I get engaged in this? Well, connect with our career services and provide an internship, provide an opportunity for our spiders to work in your organization and you'll see that your colleagues will start saying let's hire more kids from the University of Richmond because they outperform the other people that they've been hiring so uh, I think that's probably one of the best things you can do. Laura well, I'm going to hand it to you to talk a little bit more nuts and bolts about what the uh, educational opportunities are here. Yeah. Okay now my juniors you're beyond us so <laughs> you, can, you can take a little rest right now um, but the sophomores are at the stage where they're making a decision about this and your first years I just plant the seed that this is kind of your choice. So if you've liked everything you've heard um, for our first years, uh, those would be your three options for majors, uh, business administration, economics, business, and accounting. And uh, you know, if you think about your freshman class, this first year class was around 800, I think 850-ish was sort of where things are settling. Um, usually around 300 to 325 end up with us in the business school as majors or minors. Um, so a significant number of you or your friends might end up choosing this. So the way it works is that you can be an accounting major, an economics major, and be, just be that, right? But if you choose business administration, you actually have to choose something from the middle box, one of those concentrations. And that's sort of to give you your specialty. And you can choose any of those. You can choose any combination of those. There are two up there that require you to be a double concentrator. You have to pick something extra. Um, and um, Tamara, where's you, Tamara? We were talking earlier that you, for example, you can be an accounting major and be an accounting major, but if you pick an accounting concentration, you have to pick another concentration um, because it's not enough classes to actually go sit for your CPA. Um, so it makes you pair that. That's the rationale behind that. Same thing with business analytics, the idea being that you can be an analyst, but you sort of have to be an um, industry-specific kind of analyst, so maybe pair it with finance or pair it with marketing, for example. Um, and then if any of you are kind of sitting here and you're like, okay, um, you know, we're listening to the business thing, but our student or the student yourself, you might be thinking, well, I really like that PPL major, I really like computer science, or pick any of them, art, history, dance. Um, you could think about being one of our minors. So the minors are not for majors in the business school. The minors are for if you choose like leadership or arts and sciences as a major. And so our two minors are business administration and entrepreneurship. So you could be an entrepreneurship minor, but if you like the idea of entrepreneurship in the business school, then you'd pick that as your concentration very similar classes, but a minor, for example, um, in, has the minor in entrepreneurship, for example, is the first accounting class, the first economics class, a market, mark principles of marketing, and then three entrepreneurship classes. So you kind of get, get touches rather than the depth that you get within our business curriculum. And if we could really convince you like those, then let's talk about what it takes to declare. So, um, you know, you applied to the university. That was a big admissions process. Uh, what we have in the business school is actually more of, I like to call it a declaration process rather than an application or there's no essay involved. It's almost more of a checklist. So um, I know I've got a lot of you all who are in Econ 101 this fall as first year students. So you're already completing the first thing up there is that which is the required course to declare. Econ 101, Accounting 201, and Calculus. And um, 
I put up there calculus because it could be calc one, it could be calc two, it could be multivariate if you're really smarter than I am, and or it could also be your advanced placement calculus that you may be brought in from high school. So that could check that requirement off. Those are the three classes that are kind of the minimum to declare. You have to um, have earned 12 units. So, uh, you know, I know that a lot of us, when we took classes, we were taking uh, three credit classes for us here at Richmond. One class is one unit, it counts like that. So you naturally kind of hit 12 units by the end of your sophomore fall, right? So um, anyway, if you're a sophomore now, you're probably having somewhere in the range of 12 units by now. And so, as you can guess from that, typically students declare in January of their sophomore year. And so, in addition to the three classes that are the entry classes, the grade point average is at least a 2.7 or higher. And that sounds, I know you had way higher than that in high school, right? Um, so in college, we don't give boosts on grades, so a top GPA in college is a 4.0. And so a 2.7 is usually a B minus grade point average or higher. That's honestly not something that's impossible for most of our students. And then uh, we have uh, the fourth bullet up there is the Excel competency exam. And for my sophomores in the room, I suspect that's the thing that you're procrastinating on. For my first years in the room, if you want to feel like, boom, I'm ahead of things, go ahead and take that. Um, it's an exam that tests kind of your spreadsheet knowledge. And uh, it, we, ha we offer it every day of the week except Saturday um, here in the business school. So it takes about an hour, hour and a half to finish. Um, so that's something. So basically, to recap, uh, your classes, your grades, and that Excel exam, and then you naturally pretty much usually declare in January of your sophomore year. Um, now, I will say that sometimes students are declaring at that point and they haven't had, you know, maybe they haven't had a multitude of analytics classes or they have maybe only had one accounting class at that point. So once you're in the business school, you can migrate um, between those concentrations. Like if what you declared you changed your mind about, you can change it. So.